driving at Le Mans at 200 miles an hour and seeing a black crow fly from my right hand side on the Molson. And I'm thinking, I'm going to hit that effing bird <laughs> and ducking and turning my head because I'm sure that bird is going to go through my windshield and rip my head off, hit the bird and the bird glances off. And I look in the mirror and there's just uh, looks like an explosion of black um, pellets. <laughs> to another episode of Road Scholars Live, Fresh Brewed and Air Cooled Deep Tracks with Ray Schaefer. I am your co-host, Cam Ingram, owner of Road Scholars, a multiple Concord winning restoration expert, author, and public speaker. My co-host is Ray Schaefer, former GM of Brumos Porsche, racer and speaker, now flying the flag at Porsche Classic here in the United States, as we all know. Ray and our two passionate Vysock enthusiasts who work requires a daily dive down the deep tracks into Porsche history and heritage. And today, this means we are talking with Porsche long surfing, long serving, no pun intended, American team driver, Patrick Long. Ray, that was my first introduction. I don't know if I botched it, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to introduce the show today. I think you're doing a wonderful job and thank you to all who are tuning in. We're talking, of course, about Patrick Long, who is one of the most accomplished sports car drivers of his generation. In fact, since 2003, Long has served as the lone American on Porsche's roster of factory drivers. Long has captured victory at the world's biggest sports car races, winning at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, the Rolex 24 at Daytona, the 12 Hours of Sebring, Petit Le Mans, and even the 12 Hours of Bathurst. Long is also a three-time American Le Mans Series champion and two-time Pirelli World Challenge Champion. Uh, Long is also creator of Lufka Cult. Created as a celebration of air-cooled Porsches, Lufka Cult has become one of the most anticipated auto events of the year with its unique blend of historically significant Porsches, unique venues, and lifestyle elements. Long maintains a number of air-cooled Porsches at his Southern California home and often competes in vintage race events. Now for the 2020 season, Long is competing in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Series in the number 16 Wright Motorsports Porsche 911 GT3R, partnered with Ryan Hardwick, fellow here from Atlanta. Well, Cam, are you ready to drive down the deep tracks with Patrick today? I'm so excited. Let's do this, Ray Ray. All right, here we go. Patrick, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. It's wonderful to have you with us. Yeah, good to, good to see you both on uh, online. I haven't, it's not been too long since I saw you face to face, but uh, I'm excited to be asked to join you guys. I've, I've heard a lot about this show. I, I admittedly haven't seen it. So um, you got raw and unplugged this time. I like, awesome. I like the raw and unplugged and I like the Dodgers hat after winning the World Series last night. So well done the Dodgers. Yeah, yeah you know, LA, LA people are... Uh, very passionate about their sports, but we're also big bandwagoners. So, you know, when the Kings are playing well or the Dodgers are playing well, we're all into it and uh, texting back and forth. But uh, yeah, interesting times to go through a World Series in the COVID state. Um, a couple of the guys who help us at Lufka Cold are huge Dodger fans, specifically Rafael Navarro, who was ex Pirelli and a big part of bringing Pirelli to Luft, and uh, Victor Carrillo, who's ID agency. They've been uh, just going off about this. So yeah, this is this is for them and and for the Dodgers. But uh, I'm not I'm not a huge baseball fan. I grew up going to the Dodgers um, with my dad, who was a Burbank Glendale kid, um, which was interesting because they were right right around the corner. They used to sneak into the games, and of course, Burbank Glendale in the '60s was hot rod era circle track racing in in Los Angeles times. And my grandfather owned a Flying A gas station uh, just around the corner from Rod Emery's grandpa in the same period. So uh, super cool to um, have a little bit of Dodgers from my my dad and and taking us to games as a kid, and and now kind of just following distantly. Yeah, I tell you what, Mookie Betts was, it was awesome. I grew up in a baseball family, but watching Mookie Betts play this year was remarkable. He had a standout series, so really fun to watch the Dodgers uh, finally kind of 
win one. So it was great to watch. But uh, speaking of Luft, uh, this is the first time that Ray and I have ever worn other like apparel besides yeah. Classic or uh, Road Scholars. And yeah, there nice. we go. Doing it thank off. you for thank you for uh, <laughs> running the colors, boys. I um, yeah, I, I rarely I rarely wear the stuff myself. I, I guess I'm. Uh, I overanalyze and I don't want to over pump the, the brand that I, I co-founded, but um, I'm honored you guys are in the stuff and in the spirit. And we uh, take a lot of pride in the product that we put out and try to try to produce, you know, water-based high, high end cotton and not just uh, slap and plastic all on cheap t-shirts. So uh, I'll, I'll look for your guys' feedback on, on the fit and how well they're washing. And uh, if you like yeah. that, that windbreaker cam, you know, I know you're hard to please. You're, you're a style guy. So uh, I got to hit, hit my marks when I get you in something. I, I can tell you right now, cause everyone has uh, said something. I've been wearing this for two weeks straight since I, we saw you at Petit Le Mans. <laughs> And first of all, it's a totally my jam because it's like a 90s style windbreaker. It like reminds me of like a Billy Bong windbreaker I had in the 90s. It's got this kangaroo pouch. I put my phone in there. I put my uh, flashlight in there, all the stuff I use in the shop. And I basically have been living in it for two weeks. So thank you. It's really I'm, awesome. I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear. And I'm glad you like our sort of 90s fanny pack kangaroo patch up on the front. You know, we're trying to bring some of that back. <laughs> totally functional. Spot on. I could vouch for that. He at Petit Le Mans, he didn't take that thing off the whole time, and uh, <laughs> so I, I'm not surprised to hear he, he's been wearing it ever since. So that's cool. And you know, um, as we as we um, tape this, uh, it may be some time before it actually it comes out. But you know, speaking of Petit Le Mans, we we know that at this point in time, you're getting ready to head to Laguna Seca for the next round of the IMSA WeatherTech Series. Uh, you guys came off of a second in really incredible conditions at Charlotte. And uh, then a Petit Le Mans brought home an incredible fourth place finish. I mean, we watched that start to finish and it looks like you really poured that on at the end. I'm curious, um, you know, we'll probably know the answer by the time at this airs, how the championship all comes out. But what do you have to do to get the uh, your GT3R with Ryan Hardwick up to uh, the top spot of that championship? It's been hard fought, hasn't it? It has. It's um, very competitive. GT racing these days is so equally matched for better or worse. Balance of performance or BOP keeps everything very tight. Um, ABS and traction control are things that we didn't have in the Flying Lizard days or in the Peterson White Lightning days when I ran with Jurg. Um, so it allows different background drivers to get closer to the limit quicker um, and, and the mistakes are fewer and further between. That means it's really hard to race and, and to make uh, track position when you come from behind. So this day and age in IMSA in, in GTD, which is a pro-am competition, you have to have a starting amateur driver. And that's a little bit of a gray area on what constitutes a, a amateur driver these days, but it's supposed to be a driver who earns their living uh, in another way, other than in, in automotive or motorsport. And, and then it's sort of the pro's job to jump in at the end. And I love this uh, type of racing. It's sustainable. It's what a lot of sports car racing in North America was founded on. If you look back to um, the Bob Aikens of the world, the Rob Dysons of the world, and the heritage of uh, an owner driver or a sponsored driver with a pro team and a pro driver. So I think that it's the, the best era of GT racing I've been involved with and uh, maybe not the highest from a, a, a two driver competition standpoint, but I love that there's the variables of different drivers. And to answer your question, to finish this thing off strong, it's, it's going to be a monster. Uh, we're currently P2 in the championship. Uh, following uh, a, a two-car effort from Lexus with a, an amazing team, amazing drivers, and a real factory-based um, organization. And then right behind us on our heels is another factory organization from Acura with Mike Shank and um, some amazing drivers. Mario Fonbacher is just always on his game. And so uh, I love being in the middle of them with a, a first-time, first-year 911 driver and Ryan Hardwick, who's an amazing talent and an athlete and a businessman himself uh, from the Atlanta area. He has Mountain Motorsports 9 dealerships in the southeast and uh, he's a moto guy from a background he's a jet ski world champion but he's taken to this Porsche pretty well he's had a couple uh, in a Lamborghini challenge uh, and a couple of GT races last year he got really hurt at Mossport had to have a full knee replacement and uh, was out of the race car the second half of the year and um, we I, I have to say I knew Ryan was serious and I knew that this was going to be a, a, a an effort that was worth 
uh, my time and, and the team's time, but I didn't expect that he would be this competitive in a 911 uh, for his first year with a rear engine car. And he's only getting better. I think the best part about uh, helping to develop talent and, and seeing people realize their dreams in, in GT racing is, is that uh, the potential often uh, plateaus and you hit your your horizon and then, then you sort of just try to have a more efficient race. But with Ryan, he's getting better every single race. So we just need to keep hitting our marks and do what we've been doing. We've been the highest placed uh, points finisher car. And I think the last four races, if you look at the sum of points, uh, we've been on the podium three out of the last four races with a fourth, as you mentioned, at Atlanta. And um, it's easy to get sucked in. There's two races to go and you start racing for points and thinking about, should I do this move or not, or allow this prototype through championship. And for me, from the past, you just, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've ever, you've always gotten. That's what I believe. So hit your marks, uh, take one race at a time, strive for wins and uh, be there at the end. Well, I have to say that, that was some of the most exciting. I mean, this year has been really fun to watch you race in the right car, the GT3R, but at uh, Petit Le Mans, you were like in attack mode at night in the night. And it was some of the best driving, you know, we were all watching it and my father was watching it and with Owen Springer. And it was just awesome to see you in such attack mode and do some pretty aggressive passing. It was awesome. It was so fun to watch. Yeah, I am, uh, you know, I'm an emotional character. And um, when I'm confident and I'm enjoying my racing, I'm usually uh, more relaxed. And, and I get up on the wheel and I can fight with the best of the, the youth that's coming up that are some 20 years younger than me. Um, but there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of speed that still has to be um, pulled out of yourself, especially when it's uh, been a 10 hour day and you're into the night and you've got mixed weather conditions, or in this case, we had multiple uh, classes fighting for wins uh, into the same corner. And I was loving it. I just was in, in my flow state. I was just feeling good. The car was quick. And those days in, in a race car, they're effortless. Um, you guys have felt them yourself behind the wheel. When you're not overanalyzing and you're not in your own head and, and you're, you're not sort of in a, a conscious state of thought, but you're more just subconsciously trusting your abilities and your your car and, and everything comes kind of naturally. And that's how it was at Atlanta. And I can tell you, I've had some days where, you know, they talk about riding tight or driving tight, where you're just really clinched and, and nothing's going right. You can't hit their marks and the car's not handling. And um, that was not a day um, at, at this year's petite, but um, plenty of days like that. And uh, admittedly, racing is, is like golf, it's it's you against yourself most of the time mentally. So it was enjoyable. We didn't end up on the podium. Uh, we led there with a couple hours to go and ended up fourth. And that's just the summary of, of how competitive things are right now. It was a, a strategy game at the end and how many tires you put on at each pit stop really panned out to be the differentiator at the end. And uh, it was so cold that if you took four tires, you lost so much time on your outlap, just trying not to break your ass or throw the thing in the wall that um, people would make a lot of time up on you. And um, so it just was kind of ebbing and flowing on who took tires when. You know, Cam, you go back when, when, uh, when I hear Patrick talk about experience and I, you know, I think back to um, the 2007 and the DHL Penske Spider, uh, you know, that race helping Porsche carry on that, that sort of idea of being a giant killer. I mean, there's Audi, you're up against Audi with the LMP1 car, the diesel, which you know, Audi had a string of winning that 10 hour race. And then here was the LMP2 Spider that Porsche came along with, lighter weight car, less horsepower. And you're right in the thick of that. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I think that still stands as the record as the closest finish ever for a thousand mile race. Uh, less than one second between you and the, um, the winning Audi, uh, 0.923 seconds to be exact, if I recall. Yeah, yeah that was a... A, a, a vivid memory, even though what some 13 years ago um, comes down to the end and you get a yellow, you think you have it in the bag. And that yellow flag was what we didn't want to see because we could outrun the Audis over a lap, but we had nowhere near the torque or the, the straight line speed that they had. And sure enough, the yellow comes out. I can't remember why, um, but we kind of knew we were sitting ducks and they just blew right by us on the the restart um, and, and closed that gap down and had gone by us. And then it was really no way to, to fight past them. We were passing them in the pits. We were passing them on the long run in traffic, but never, never could draw alongside of them and, and get by them, even in the break zones as a much smaller and lighter car. But um, still an amazing night uh, to win um, 
my third petite Le Mans, but that time in a prototype was was a lot of fun and almost an overall win. Um, I'm known mostly as a GT driver and very grateful for the opportunities in, in 911s for the last two decades with Porsche, but driving in that Penske Spider is, is sort of the heyday for me when I, I, I think about stepping away from driving one day. What I'll be telling the guys down at the coffee shop is definitely about the days driving for Roger in a prototype. They weren't my most enjoyable days um, in a race car or in a program. It was so high stakes, it was so much pressure. Mm. Um, it was foreign to me, um, the amount of downforce. I think that year at, or the year after at Mid-Ohio, we were quicker in qualifying than the Indy cars who were there on the same weekend as us. So a huge amount of downforce, uh, physicality of the car and, and what it did to your body was something my body wasn't developed um, in, in single seaters like a lot of the guys that I was up against. So it was um, daunting at, at times and, and really a, a big struggle for me. But um, at other times, it taught me to dig deep within myself and to learn about new uh, just tenors of, of how to pull out performance from yourself up against guys who have Formula One and IndyCar backgrounds and decades of single seater racing. So um, great to think back on that night. And, and certainly it was a, a little bit of a letdown, mostly for Timo and Roma, uh, Timo Bernhard and Roman Dumas, my, my driving teammates, they were in the championship. I was sort of the stand in uh, long distance driver and uh, really, really there to run the middle stint of the, of the race. But by that time I was sort of uh, up on the in the motorhome and, and enjoying myself, uh, hoping for a full uh, full victory there. That's amazing. You know, like we said uh, prior to the show, Ray and I have been doing so much research on your career. And obviously, you're one of those guys that have seen two decades of really the modern Porsche 996 Cup car, Super Cup, RSRs. And there's very few people that have been racing 911s in the modern era and all these variations and derivatives and you are the GT guy, but your mental toughness because your determination to be a factory driver through de two decades of racing. And I think that really illustrates your mental toughness and your determination because you're just saying that was not an enjoyable year because of the high stakes and the pressure. And is this year been enjoyable? I mean, if you think about this evolution of your beginnings with Fortune where you are now and almost a mentor you're still fat, you're still the hot shoe, the professional driver, but are you enjoying your role now in today's world? I really am. Um, I'm sort of in that place of um, still being able to perform and, and, and fight uh, against some of the best guys that are coming up and some of the most established veterans. Um, but it's also a place for me to um, develop myself um, as a leader, um, as a, a mentor to Ryan, or working with John Wright and my organization uh, behind me as a team, um, you know, I, I, I'm able to sort of wear two hats and, and be the driver and, and help develop the car as quickly as possible. There's not a lot of track time, especially in these COVID times with shortened schedules, but also to uh, work with John and the team on strategy, um, business strategy, racing strategy. Um, and, and just try to, to learn from so many people uh, around me who are technically uh, some of the best in the world and such intelligent people. So yeah, I have a little more bandwidth to soak it all in, to look around and realize that um, I'm not gonna race into my fifties like some of these guys. Um, I, I have a lot of things I still wanna do and I see motorsport as a foundation and an education to uh, grow and, and develop into something else to contribute to society than just being an athlete and, and kind of a spoiled brat who shows up last and leaves first with everything taken care of and told where to go, when to be, uh, how to do it. And um, in this case, I think that's what's opened an envelope for me. And um, just it's my education um, being around people who have been successful enough to spend money in, in their golf game of motorsport or to lead um, what is such a competitive uh, environment of, of sport with sports car racing. If they're at this level, then they've done amazing things uh, at the track or away from the track. And I'm, I'm grateful to be around them on a week to week basis. Yeah. You know, I, Cam and I were talking uh, offline a little bit about time timelines. If you think really about, um, you know, what we've been able to experience kind of right there with you, uh, looking back in uh, 1998, which was the uh, 50th anniversary of Porsche it was the, um, the first Petit Le Mans. And again, going back to that 2007 program, they did a really neat piece that talked about drivers and where were you in 1998. And they pointed out uh, you were 17 years old at the time and you were already showing the talent that earned you a top spot as a Porsche factory driver back then. 
um, you know, being the first American in 20 years to win an international European karting event, uh, placing second in the International North American Karting Championship um, that year with 15 WKA Cup Series wins in a row, which is just amazing. And then you think 10 years later, you know, um, Rensport comes along and, and you're sort of in there now. You've accomplished all these great things as a driver. Uh, you show up, you know, you're at Rensport and you're in the most recent Rensport. Um, getting to experience so many incredible cars. You mentioned Bob Aiken. I know you had that great piece you did where you drove the um, Coca-Cola 935, um, the 962s, and of course the Indy car. Seeing that Indy car run at Laguna uh, was very special because I hadn't seen that car run since back in the day. Um, and you were behind the wheel. I mean, just such an incredible arc that, um, you know, now that you look at it, you're entering your third decade as a, as a Porsche racer, as a factory deal, um, growing like, you, like you're talking about growing, but also, um, as Cam pointed out, racing 911s. I mean, really, from the start of the liquid-cooled era, which is huge for Porsche, the beginning of the 996, all the way up to now the 991.2, you've seen so much evolution in the cars themselves uh, it would be interesting to kind of like get some insight from you as to how you felt the car developed, because not only is it liquid cooled, but in there's also uh, a one of a kind hybrid that Porsche did that you were also involved in with another uh, former guest of ours, Marco Holzer. Yeah, that's um, that's a lot. That's a loaded question, Ray. Um, it's a lot. I, I um, you did a lot. Yeah, I, I just feel like a Southern California kid who snuck away from whatever was going on in my household um, to my parents' bedroom and turned on ESPN Speed World and was watching Group C racing in its, its, era, in its era in GTP days um, to get to strap into a 962 a couple of decades later is it's unbelievable. I mean, it's emotional to think about it and talk about it right now. Um, it's just so much opportunity that Porsche has given me and allowed me to fulfill dreams and in, in such a versatile um, landscape of different cars and eras, um, different racetracks, countries. I think we tallied up 18 different countries or something that we've been racing um, in. Uh, I've been racing as a driver for Porsche. So yeah, you can tell in my voice that I'm just humbled and grateful that people trust me and want to see me drive in one of their multi-million dollar cars, be it a 99 six or a, a, a GTP car, an Indy car, or a modern 992. I just rolled the new Porsche Cup car up onto the stage at a, a sneak preview in Ohio. I'm excited to get into my first 992 race car, um, only going two miles an hour uh, through smoke and lights, but didn't drive it off the end of the stage. The um, the difference in in all of this is, is just experience when we're all gone and uh, the lights are turned off and the cameras are off uh, and you can look back at everything that we've done in our lives you know it's relationships it's um you know personal experience and, and getting to do different things and that's rich in my opinion and um i feel very very rich in in those cases um it, it it's hard to put uh, my finger on on all the different 9-11 eras and and what they mean to me all I could say is, is that when we started in, in 996, or when I got my first run in a 996 GT car at Petit Le Mans 2003, I was a rookie coming out of Super Cup and Carrera Cup in Europe. Uh, then, you know, it's analog um, RPM, you know, H pattern synchro streetcar gearboxes and racing on the grand stage right before Formula One went live at Monaco or um, Silverstone. Um, Monza was just electric standing in, you know, had a Marlboro grid girl standing in front of me. Oh, cool. And I thought to myself, I'm 21 years old and I, I can't believe this. The, the <laughs> stands were completely full. The Tafosi was literally, you could feel, feel them cheering before the race went live. And I was starting on the front row against my teammate, Mike Rockenfeller, who's a veteran factory driver for Audi and DTM. And of course has won Le Mans overall for Audi. And we went down into turn one elbows up and just kids racing go-karts kind of in, in the grand stage. But back to the um, 996 and getting into a GT car with TRG for my first race at the end of the 2003 championship there at, at Petit, it was a loud raw a nine, just a super cool car, no ABS, no driver aids, no traction control, still three pedals, 
tell kids these days that I actually had to flip the downshift uh, back when I was young and uh, they don't know what I'm talking about. You know, yes. now everything's auto blipped and two, <laughs> two pedals. So that was actually a weekend by a sidebar that I met Jeff Swart um, for the first time. He was in a sister TRG car and um, he approached me. I was watching, trying to learn the racetrack and figure out how this multi-class racing worked. And this guy started talking to me and really nice dude. And, um, you know, and just answering his questions and, and, he told me, oh, I'm racing in the number 68 car. And I was like, no way, you know, and we just started shooting the breeze and uh, sat next to each other at the, the IMSA autograph session and continued our conversations and a friendship um, blossomed from, from that weekend. But um, if I jump forward into the 997 days, um, you went now into sequential boxes. The end of 996, we transitioned into a sequential box with a flat shift upshift, but we still had to downshift and blip on the way down. Um, more aero, uh, more race car, but a lot of the DNA of what the RSRs had in the 996 days in Gen 1 and Gen 2. And then 991, the game really started to change with the factory cars and the introduction of, of the core uh, white car program. Uh, that was the end of uh, 2013 and into the 2014 season. Um, and, and you think about this, just the different generations and the evolution of, of a 911. Um, the Mecca or the, the, I think one of the most radical uh, re thoughts of GT racing was jumping into the, the, what do they call it? The engine that's forward of the rear axle, right, which right. of course is a mid engine 911. Right. Um, the difference there was the aerodynamics of that car and the placement of the engine and just the evolution of the class in general. It's more developed and, and a more aggressive driving style than a lot of prototypes I've raced in my career, specifically the Daytona prototype era. That car would would outperform a Daytona prototype, no question. Um, just the way the driving style and the the lack of roll, um, just a low CG and and just an aggressive driving stance. Um, you actually transitioning between uh, the mid engine 911 RSR that you see in GTLM versus my 911 in the GT3 R. I know these are a lot of acronyms for people who don't study this stuff religiously, but um, the, the, the traditional 911, it's a big transition to go between the two cars. And I see a, a lot of my factory colleagues jumping out of the car last weekend in Spa, and they'll be this weekend coming up in the RSR. And, and that takes a couple of laps to, to re focus and to kind of recalibrate your your g meter in your in your butt um, because the, the car just don't move those mid-engine cars with all that downforce they're just stuck to the ground uh, versus when you get back into a gt3 car um, they move around and they give that more traditional feel of a 911 but i know this is a, a five minute answer but the, the the last thing i'll tell you is that driving a 911 um from from the early 60s or mid 60s on the first generation 911 all the way to today's gt3r there are a lot of parallels and similarities and uh, it's not just the the look and the shape and, and the rear engine the driving styles translate the braking points and the, the the trail off brake trail on throttle a lot of those things i carry through all the different generations of 911 so it's not just the water cooled era of my evolution of a pro driver but jumping back into a 993 rsr um or or anything previous to that there there is so much that carries through and it just shows how good they were um, from their beginning state all the way to uh, what we're doing with them today so it's a a, a huge um just tip of the hat to how how awesome the 911s are as a, a, a designed, a passionate and uh, enthusiasm driven car. I, I mean, I, that was the most synop best synopsis of following liquid cool, you know, race car evolution. That was wonderful. And one of the things I thought of what you just said a few minutes ago really struck me is that you've had this experience of racing for these iconic US teams from TRG to Flying Lizard to Core to Proton, to all these incredible teams. And, you know, you've been so humble, but Ray and I know that your work ethic is profound. You have one of the strongest work ethics. Not only are you a tough driver, but your experience of, you have so many tools in your bag and being able to articulate these things to not just a team owner, but a team and a co-driver is a remarkable thing. And I just think we don't think about these intangible skill sets and also what goes into making a successful team because it's not just the car or the prep there's all these other factors and i think i'm just i'm marveling i didn't think fully appreciate about what you what you said earlier about what you're bringing to the right organization and this background of knowledge and i think that's empirical and priceless in so many ways 
Yeah, it's an interesting um, juxtaposition because if you think about it, we're sort of a traveling salesman, um, but we're also a traveling consultant. And then you're sort of the clown that performs. And so you wear three hats, but you're diving into different cultures. It's it's like um, I, I ro roll into Road Scholars um, for the weekend and I need to bring something to the table and contribute and, and be that kind of finishing artist or, or the, the person who carries the cake across the finish line. Um, in some ways, you're, you're the one who can make or break the whole business um, effort from that entire week or entire year, but also just to slither in and um, immerse yourself in someone else's business culture and, and then to bounce out and head to your next business stop. Um, you really are uh, in some years working for four different businesses um, and, and you have to readjust. Everybody operates differently. Every single individual within a team uh, operates differently. And, and then you have the machine that we're all trying to improve. And both of you know that from uh, the effort of a, of a restoration or the development of a, a, a car that you can skin the cat many different ways. And leadership is, is something that isn't always as easy as we all think or read about. And so um, it's fun to um, have different roles in different teams. Sometimes I show up and I'm just a soldier and I'm just a number, a spacer, and you just plug yourself in. Don't say a lot on the radio, make fast laps, jump out, let the next guy take a stint. And other times uh, the team owner looks to you um, for direction technically from a business standpoint, marketing, um, politics within the race series. Um, so I love all that. I love those challenges. Again, I touch on that. I love, I love the education of it, but it's certainly um, fun to reflect on it. And, and just to think about how you hone your craft as a driver, it's, it's easy to be, um, you know, kind of one of those spoiled single seater uh, mindset drivers. It's just, I'm here to show how good I am, um, how much better I am than my teammates and how I'm the best. And that does pull out a lot of performance over one lap, but sometimes uh, it's a culture clash within a team um, or worse off, it ends up where you, you bang a race car up, just putting yourself first. And uh, it takes a lot of years to rid yourself of that, whether it's your animal and who you're made up as, as a competitor or a business person and how you drive and, and having to show enough performance to even get a chance to make a name, um, that, that is hard to undo. Um, we come in as trained, kill, attack, fight dogs, and you're sort of embedded into a family household. And now you're not supposed to, you know, chew up the furniture or or bite the other dogs. And um, you know, you're you're supposed to act like a professional, and you're supposed to compromise and share the seat with other people. And maybe you don't get the cartoon right around you. And so it's always interesting when when you're young and hungry and you come in uh, to this different world and all of a sudden it's not all about you. And um, I, I don't always wanna be the old wise man with the long view because that does hurt your lap times and it does hurt the decision on who gets that last stint when you got to fight to the end. So you just have to balance it. You have to know uh, which which person to bring to the table depending on how that program or that race or, or that season is unfolding. And uh, I love those challenges of the psychology side. Has that, got, has that part gotten easier uh, with time and experience as far as knowing when to turn that on and off? Or is that something that you really have to like, just look, stop and look at the situation and really think that one through? Uh, it, it changes year to year. Um, right now, I feel I feel good. Other times you're in a program where you, you, you aren't in a position or in that confident state that you need um, to be your very top of the game. But um, no, I, I like that challenge right now. Um, I apply myself that way um, and I, I've, I've not talked about it um, very much in the open for, for many, many years. And I did an interview, I believe it was uh, the beginning of last year at Daytona with a European journalist and he printed the whole interview and I was thought we were sort of just chatting as the three of us are right now. And it was fine. I was I knew I was speaking to a journalist, so everything is on record at that point. But um, I'm kind of finding my own truth um, in these days where I don't have to be just such a poker player and a competitor where I'm worried about what my competition is studying up on me or if they know too much about where my head is when we go down into the last corner on the last lap and kind of have to know who you're up against. Um, 
you know, it's, it's just finding that peace and, and being able to, uh, you know, be comfortable with, with what that animal is that you are uh, within a team. And I think every driver is a pretty deep subject. When you look at pro drivers, they're definitely um, extreme personalities most of the time, extremely introverted, extremely extroverted, uh, driven by ego, driven by something that makes them want to pound laps for three and a half hours, showing the world how good they are. I mean, it's a it's a wild uh, group of, of characters, that's for sure. That's awesome. That's awesome. I do love that. I do love that. Well, you know, we're, we're talking an awful lot about um, uh, competitors, other drivers. Let's talk about events. And, you know, you've mentioned being all over the world, traveling for different race events and what have you. And when Cam and I were at the Petit Le Mans, we were talking about that 10 hour race. At one point in time, it was a thousand miles or 10 hours, whatever came first. Now it's just a straight 10 hour. So it fits in there with um, obviously the 12 hour at Sebring. We've got the six hour at Watkins Glen. And of course in your resume as well, you even have Bathurst in there. Um, I was hoping you might be able to compare and contrast a little bit the experiences that you've had at these various uh, great endurance races. Um, you know, the nature of the events, the elements of the events, and kind of, you know, how each one is um, is a bit of a challenge in its own uh, unique way. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the grand, grand stage of endurance racing and the ones you touched on, um, Bathurst, uh, Nürburgring, Daytona, Le Mans, um, they are each in their own right, that respective countries, Indianapolis 500. I mean, when you go to the Nürburgring, you realize that that is their race. They don't grow up idolizing Monaco. They don't grow up idolizing Le Mans. They grow up living and breathing for 24 hours of live TV and the Nürburgring Nordschleife. And, and they bring that game, whether it's a fan, whether it's a competitor, um, same goes for Bathurst. Um, you ask an Australian where Bathurst is and they'll be able to tell you, anybody on the street knows where Bathurst is, even though it's in the bush in the middle of nowhere, a couple hours outside of Sydney. Um, it's a national sport and, and a pastime there. And uh, it's, it's like baseball or football in this country um, for Australia, for Germany, for France. Um, yeah. So there's that atmosphere and that heritage and that prestige when you show up. And then there's the racetracks that make them what they are of, of special racetracks and, and special events. Um, Bathurst, Nordschleife, uh, Le Mans, those three stand out to me. Daytona is there as well. Um, and of course, domestically, Sebring and Petit Le Mans, you can add to that list, but they're, they're giants of racetracks. They are the difference between um, the, the has-beens and the has-nots and, and the, the heroes, um, the men and the boys, if we're, if we're not um, diplomatic about it. Um, the stakes are high, the walls are close, um, and mortality um, is there and it's alive and present even in this day and age of, of sport uh, of motorsport and the development of safety when you race at Bathurst um, you think about the real outcome of, 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 of an unfortunate situation um, you don't think about it in the race car you don't think about it when you throw it up the inside of another driver but subconsciously it's logged in there um, you know I'll, I'll tell stories that people won't really believe um, and maybe you guys want to follow up on some of these, but driving at Le Mans at 200 miles an hour and seeing a black crow fly from my right-hand side on the Molson, and I'm thinking, I'm going to hit that effing bird <laughs> and ducking and turning my head because I'm sure that bird is going to go through my windshield and rip my head off, hit the bird, and the bird glances off, and I look in the mirror and there's just... Uh, looks like an explosion of black um, pellets. Um, kangaroos on the racetrack during the Bathurst 12 hour um, in the pitch black at five in the morning when the race starts. Don't ask me why it starts at five in the morning in the pitch black when we've never driven on the track at night. There's no night practice. There's no lights around the track. And then you have yellow flags for kangaroos, um, which are big rodents in the Australians minds they're not they're not um, zoo animals they're rodents um, they jump the fence and they take cars out when a, when a car hits a kangaroo at Bathurst that car is is done and and sometimes worse and um, Nürburgring um, a little story if, if there's time would be um, yeah uh, so I show up to Nürburgring um, for my first 24 hour I had been there and done the shorter race the VLN um, this was actually 
different car with no that race. And I don't know if he told you this story, so stop me if he did. But um, there was pit stop practice when I showed up to the track and you get no practice time at the Nürburgring. Um, and I thought to myself, well, you don't need pit stop practice at the Nürburgring because you get bloody two minutes for a pit stop because you use a normal fuel um, hose to f refuel and you say you share the pit space with four other teams and it's just a total crap show. Um, so pit stop practice was actually the drivers um, learning how to change the wheel on the car. Wow. So they, they bring the air bottle up and they say, okay, plug it in here. I know you've seen this happen from the driver's seat, but now it's your turn. Plug it in here, jack the car up, take the air gun, buzz the wheel off, change the wheel, buzz the back on, lower the car. If you get, and of course, I won't, I'll spare you my bad German accent, but um, if you get the flat on the back of the track, yeah, you're going to stop and change the tire because you will not make it back. You understand? So um, basically, we had to know uh, where a set of four tires, an air bottle, and a, and a gun were ditched in the woods. And if you had a bad flat, it was going to be safer and quicker. They probably figured we wouldn't make it back because it's such a long lap there that you're, you're some eight miles from the pits. So sure enough, I get hit by a Clio um, in a six gear corner after Flugplatz. Um, I go up over the brow backwards, I spin, hit the barrier, come out of it pretty unscathed for as gnarly of a, of a deal as it was. I was passing him flat out on a double left and he clipped, he tracked out, he didn't see me and he clipped my left rear and spun me back the, over the hill anyways. Um, I know right where the, the, the wheels in, are ditched in the little cut and I, there's, a, there's a break in the wall and I, I go up, I stop, I let the car roll through the brake. So I'm now off the racetrack. Of course, at the Nürburgring, there are no full course yellows. So this all happened under green flag conditions. I'm going you know, with one broken rim and, and a flat tire. So it's the next day, this is, this is 10 a.m. after a full night of racing and we're coming you know, within a few hours of the finish and it was a terrible race for us in the hybrid. So yeah, I back the car down in there and I'm unstrapped myself. No one can help you. That's part of the rule. But of course, it's full of sunburned drunk fans um, and they see the car coming. And so there's hundreds of them standing around and I'm sweating and I'm just trying to wipe sweat out of my eyes. And I change the wheel, strap myself back on in, get the radio on um, and then drive back out through the brake and back onto the track. And, and it was a rain tire because they figured if it's raining, and you need to make it back better to be with a rain tire if it's dry you're you're still just getting back to the pit so i had one rain tire and three slicks and sort of got myself back to the pit lane and i just i was so freaked out by the incident why i got hit at such a high rate of speed um that all i wanted to do was tell someone what had happened and and swear at the car who happened to be sharing the pit box with us because uh -huh. they stuffed four cars in one garage at the north Seife. And they just said to me, you're going to go for another stint. So tell us about the story later, you know? So it was kind of that get back on the horse and ride. You, wow. you, you just saw your life flash in front of your eyes and they're like, yeah, keep going. You know, we're, we're sort of out of this race anyway. So yeah, just crazy stories like that um, in, in all of these different endurance races. But I will tell you that uh, one of the greatest accomplishments uh, was finishing second in class and usually second sucks, but second in class at Le Mans with Patrick Dempsey. Um, seeing him um, in tears and achieve a lifelong uh, goal of being on the podium at Le Mans. Uh, we were third in the late stages and, and slipped into second through um, some attrition from the competitors ahead of us. And yeah, I, I felt like a um, kind of like a father figure at that point. I was just so content to see him content that it wasn't really about the result. It was just seeing somebody um, just completely overwhelmed by emotion and uh, having a, a stake in that more so than just co-driving with him, but um, trying to develop him as a driver and, and working with him as a friend. And we had traveled the world that year and uh, later on found our first victory in, in Fuji in Japan and uh, still talk to that guy probably every three days, um, just such a, a great human being and a, and a pure, passionate uh, student of the sport. 100%, that, that is, um... That's really cool. I mean, you hearing you talk about special friendships like that, you know, I, I, I think back to um, to my Brumos days and I, I still remember when you were when you were kind of starting out there um, and the attention that, you know, I know Bob Snodgrass always kind of had his eye on you and um, you had a, obviously a special friendship and relationship with Hurley, who 
I think has made, um, you know, through that, it seems like, um, you know, your careers and sort of your ambassadorship, if you will, for the Porsche brand, you, you, you two seem very similar to me and your love and respect for, for the sport as well as for the brand itself and what, what Porsche represents. And man, I just think you've done a wonderful job with that. That's cool to hear you talk about, you know, kind of sign full circle on that where you feel like you're, you're able to do the same for others. And I just think that's really cool. Kudos to you. Thanks, man. Yeah. Um, Bob Snodgrass, what a character, um, what a, what a, a passionate uh, individual. And I remember the first time I visited the dealership and we went out to Dan's um, farm and saw his, his amazing lodge and retreat. And um, that was the same time I had met Hurley and, and um, yeah, I, all I can tell you is, is that Hurley was a guy I grew up watching race IROC and, and everything else, Trans Am, um, GTP. And um, then you meet the, the kind of hardened uh, business Hurley and you're like, okay, yeah, great guy, but doesn't give you a lot of, of his time or, or um, he doesn't open himself up to you right away. Um, but he is direct, he is honest, and he is, is authentic. Um, and then you, um, if you're lucky enough to be led into Hurley's real side, um, you realize what a, an amazing and gentle human he is, um, what an amazing driver he still is. I mean, that guy still can stand on the gas. I mean, I will never question um, racing drivers uh, again, because you just don't realize it till you're wheel to wheel with them. And driving with him and Fulmer in 917s at the last Rensport, those guys are absolutely nuts. First of all, I, I, if you look, you know, you, you wonder the physicality and how their hearts really are, are seasoned for that type of race car um, at their age. But yeah, I mean, Jochen Maas as well, those guys just hammered. I was trying to stay up with them. I mean, Canapa, he was easy. It got by him in a second, but getting to Fulmer and getting to Hurley, that's another story. <laughs> you know, uh, Patrick, I think the last two Ren Sports, it's been a revelation to watch you race these historic cars. It's been really, you've been talking about all these universal truths today from a business standpoint and from a driving standpoint, but some of the most exciting driving I've seen you do in person has been these last few Ren Sports, and you've really gone, you know, really aggressive on the equipment. And it's just been a joy to see these, you know, significant Porsche race cars being driven like that. And I know Alan Benjamin's uh, been a big conduit for you to do that. And it's just been really fun for Porsche race fans to see you navigate these worlds that you navigate, not, not just with your Luft event and your driving crew, but also this other component that we're all crazy about, the historic Porsche history. So it's just, it's badass, really. And you're such a, you're kind of a renaissance man. You know, you and Jeff's work, as we always, everyone in the industry knows Jeff's a renaissance man, but I don't think people fully appreciate or have really acknowledged that you are such a renaissance accomplished person, not just as a driver, but a businessman. And you're really treating us to a new generation of modern Porsches. So it's, it's really cool. Thanks, man. I um, I love the the opportunity again and in jumping into people's stuff and, and into their cars and and getting to experience them. Uh, I'm still in my 30s, so I I feel like I'm in some ways just getting started. Um, the I will say that I don't drive every car as hard as I drive Alan's cars, but um, if the factory or or a private owner says I want to see this thing win, and I want to see this thing sideways, and I want to see it on that limit, and it, it can do it then I do it. But um, as you know, when I got the opportunity to drive the 904 that, that Road Scholars restored for Bob, um, that was all about just smelling the roses and experiencing that car. There was no lap times, there were no stakes. It was just, uh, you know, a polo shirt and a helmet and and an Nardi steering wheel or, or whatever that steering wheel was, but it was wooden and it was slippery and without gloves. I'll never make fun of people for wearing leather driving gloves anymore. And now I understand that when you have sweaty hands and a wood steering wheel, the, the thought I kept having going up the S's at VIR in, in your 904 was, man, if I lose grip on this steering wheel, this is going to be a, a, a hard one to explain um, when I bring when I bring back just the steering wheel. But um, no, it's um, it's it's an immense it's an immense opportunity to sample uh, cars that were um, in their in their heyday long before I was born. And um, I think that the era um, of 60s and 70s race cars 
is my favorite because it's what we all fell in love with as as kids driving uh, where you, you had to do so many things to make that car function uh, in, in a high performing way, whether it was keeping the carbs cleaned or the brakes from burning off or the, the tires from pitching you sideways and throwing you off the track. And um, it's so much of a different art. And it is an art because you can drive uh, the lap time three or four different ways uh, where today in this day and age, uh, I'm still grateful for what I get to do as a real job, but it's very digital. It's basically one way to make a car go fast and and that's that's it um so the anytime i get a chance to go jump in different cars um it's it's what i love to do there's still bucket list items um races such as Le Mans classic or a goodwood revival that I, I haven't been to or or competed in but yeah ren sport is is really that celebration um that we all love of of racing and and you know just bonds, people forging relationships over years and, and everyone getting together and seeing each other. And I think Luft um, stemmed from a lot of these things that we're talking about, the enjoyment and the passion of classic Porsches, um, the relationships that you feel every four years when you're at Ren Sport. Um, these are all inspirations um, for me to um, start what I thought was just a little coffee shop gathering of air-cooled cars in 2014. And here we are. I hear somebody in the background getting on it. I, yeah, I'm not good. looking out over over a, a pretty insane view, and uh, there's somebody somebody's out there um, in oh, one man. of those canyons on on the on the gas. So that was cool. I thought that was somebody's ringtone, but it's actually somebody out getting on the throttle. I love it. Yeah, yeah you're in the right we're spot. In nature. We're yeah, definitely well, in some nature. You 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 know you brought up a good point. And I think while it while it could be a total show on its own, a total conversation uh, just on Lufka cult. I think you know we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on it because you're absolutely right. What you and co-creator Howie Idelson have uh, put together, um, you know, as you, as you point out on your website, and I and I have it here, you know, I, it's a true Porsche happening. I mean, it's um, uh, the whole formula of ground it, the as you call it, the recipe. For those of us who have been fortunate enough to have been to one or two or three uh, of them. I mean, it's no set formula, but you, when you're there, you just know it. I mean, you guys have somehow captured with, along with Jeff Swartz creativity, uh, just this, these incredible settings uh, for, for how you bring the community together uh, at these annual opportunities. And I know it's been tough this year to try and pull that off, but um, you've still managed to move, I think, forward with it despite that. Um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about Lufka Cult. Sure. Um, the... The, the recipe um, was just, um, I bought a 3.2 Carrera, which Cam actually helped me find uh, Mr. Newton as the PPI on that car. And um, I, I got my hands on my first air-cooled car after talking about it for 10 years and finally shelled up the money. And I just wanted to go meet people and talk about the car and learn about air-cooled and talk about whether I should take the rear tail off that car, which I'm glad I didn't because um, the car was so preserved. Um, and I couldn't really find a, a, an audience in LA. There was no um, coffee shop car vibe. There was no Cars and Coffee in Malibu or Los Angeles. Uh, there was the original Cars and Coffee um, in Irvine, which Freeman was a big part of founding. And that was an amazing event. And it was an hour and a half from my house. Nobody wanted to go with me from Los Angeles down to Orange County. and Critically, it was very much the same six or seven Porsches every single time. And how was I ever going to bring my wife to uh, an event that started at 6 a.m. on a Sunday or, uh, sorry, a Saturday? Um, and and there really wasn't much else out there other than annual events uh, with the club or or some of the big um, concourses. And so, uh, I I found myself inspired in Venice Beach, California. There was a, a, a hipster creativity to the coffee shop vibe. Deus, who I had run into four or five years before racing V8 supercars in Australia, uh, was a brand that spoke to me. Um, it was a culture. Any given weekday, um, sitting there, it was just beautiful cars, people, motorcycles, great weather, coffee. And um, I forged a relationship through um, uh, Howie, who was a lifelong friend of mine from the karting days, uh, with Julian and the Australian team that ran that place. And I asked them, I said, Do I want to throw a car party here? And they said, Here? Where? You know, this is a little dinky car coffee shop. I said, yeah, I'm going to put 38 of the best air-cooled cars um, into this parking lot. And they said, knock yourself out. And uh, <laughs> we'll believe it when we see it. 
And <laughs> what my what my founder was was to bring people who are not part of the Porsche culture over to a coffee shop on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Um, hand them a taco and, a, and an early beer and, and play some good music and walk them around and show them not the best in the in the sense of, of condition or value, but the best of the best of a compilation CD of all the different genres of what I was on a, on a journey to learn about and what I had embarked on, which was understanding the outlaw community, the art group guys, the, the Magnuses of the world versus the concourse and the club members and the collectors and the restore the restorers and everything in between. I just wanted a little peppering of everything. Alan Benjamin brought a original GT2 from Colorado. Um, my friend Efren Olivares had a, a, a probably a fifteen thousand dollar, maybe less, probably a ten thousand dollar investment of his own uh, Pride and Joy 912 parked right next to an original 27 RS. And I, I I laid the cars out in a way that was more about a storytelling than it was about visuals. At that point, we hadn't perfectly refined that part, but thanks to Jeff Zwart and and to uh, a lot of other contributors, we found our formula in in laying cars out in more of an art um, exhibition um, or installation than just a parking lot of sea of cars. Um, and, and that was it, um, that was the start. I knew that I wanted a, a few principles, which was never boring, um, never predictable, never um, exclusive, um, and always spreading the message of how impactful and powerful and, and amazing um, these cars are and and as soon as we lock the doors and turn this into a a, a boys club we're failing um, the future of of these cars and and the future of this community and so Luft is just about inspiring the next generation and celebrating the heroes that deserve um, that attention. Well good to you I mean it really Luft has become it's so often said a, a phenomenon for a reason because you are celebrating all these different Porsche cultures this Porsche universe of passion and storytelling, whether it's race car drivers, collectors, or just the average Joe, I can, you know, like, I love the story of a 912 sitting next to something that's a priceless Porsche, but we're all bonded by this shared passion. And thank you for creating an event that really unifies. Uh, it doesn't polarize, it unifies this world. And you can be anyone from any different background and we share this combined passion and we get to share it with our loved ones who might not be Porsche files, but it, you've created an event that is accessible to everyone. So thank you from everyone in the Porsche world. So it's really unique to see. No doubt. Oh, thank you. Uh, we say if, um, if the legends don't want to come or the non car person doesn't want to show up, then it's time to tune the carburetor because that means uh, we're doing something wrong. The, the meat in the sandwich is, is the three of us. We, we live this uh, daily and we, we love it. And it's never, it's never gonna uh, dry up the passion, but um, we have to continue to inspire and, and celebrate. And, and that's the bookends, that's what matters. It's the Vic Gelfords of the world and um, the 12 year olds um, who, who are just there with a, a camera in their hand and, and they're like most of us, dragged along to an event by their parents. And if we can burn a memory into their mind and, and infect them um, and, and keep, keep the, uh, the loud fire breathing combustion engine um, as part of car culture, then um, we're, we're doing something right. And I also love um, that air cooled cars can be uh, an introduction into the Porsche brand. Um, I talk a lot with um, some of the higher ups at Porsche um, about how this is um, a, a, an achievable or an obtainable entry point into um, the community um, that is such a special heritage and, and culture that is Porsche. And so there still are some cars out there that are relatively affordable. I'm sure you guys have talked about that on this show and um, we, we love that part of it too. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And as, as I pointed out, I mean, it, it's been, I know a challenge this year uh, with COVID-19 trying to figure out how to navigate that when it comes to events. Uh, but lately, uh, with recently, we were talking about Petit Le Mans, just right down the road, the Petit Soiree that you had at the Brazelton Brewing Company, a, a sort of a micro gathering, as you called it, um, you know, air-cooled vibes, music and eats and beer. That was, that was a great time uh, on a local level. It was just wonderful to have that option right down the road. 
And then at the race itself, the uh, Luft pop-up that you did to celebrate the announcement of the North American Carrera Cup. Um, you know, interesting how you're, you're kind of doing that. I know there's been a couple of uh, European trips that you've taken as a group. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit uh, before we finish up about the, um, uh, what the thinking is and maybe where you're heading? Are we going to see more uh, pop-ups like, uh, like we saw at Petit? Yeah, um, I like these little snacks um, of, of Luft when, when we can't have the big meal. Um, it's just not the time yet for the, the, the all-inclusive, all-encompassing. And so um, just little things I, I, you know, the team comes up with or I think about in my travels uh, where we can achieve or, or um, share um, some of that um, Luft principle. Um, in a kind of socially responsible way um, through all of this pandemic. We, we all want to see this behind us. And so we have to do our part. And yeah, I do have plans uh, with the team for a few few more little uh, treats, a few more tricks up our sleeve, um, trying to, to do it on a local level where we, we kind of come to you versus asking you to get on a plane or uh, to stand in a, a circle with thousands of people. Um, Lyft has become a, a little bit of, a, a, of, a, of its own beast. And um, you know, this, there's no time for for seven or eight thousand people together, but um, for a hundred or two hundred people to keep their distance and um, enjoy some cars in a local way, that that that's definitely on the mind right now. Um, we're also working behind the scenes to just be a, a tighter, uh, more resilient and reliable company uh, for when the big shows do come back. So, a little Hot Wheels collaboration is coming out, um, a fun Chopar collaboration, as well as our second book. Would be my little plugs there you go yeah. um those are those are some things that we've been working on in the COVID times and uh you know when th when something like this comes up a lot of people who are watching this are, are small business owners um you know luft is is hand to mouth there are no big investments or corporations that are pumping uh security into us we have our faithful sponsors and our, our people who buy merch on the website is what keeps Luft alive. And um, so it's been trying, just like many of us, um, to keep the lights on in these times. And, um, you know, Atlanta was an idea um, that I had about actually a motorsport idea where I wanted to create a celebration in the paddock. And I have to do that carefully. It's a little bit like playing um, Jenga, you know, when the thing's about to tip every single time you, you poke on a block. Um, that's my brand. That's our brand of Luft, and and you have to be careful when you go outside of the recipe, um, and and this was about um, curating a space to uh, celebrate the Career Cup, and a specifically the air cooled uh, heritage within the Career Cup as the U.S. Career Cup comes to market for the first time in 2000. It's the North American Career Cup. I'll, I'll um, correct myself. The North American Career Cup comes to light in 2021. Um, an amazing uh, feather in the global Porsche motorsport cap uh, to get that here domestically. It's where I started my career with Porsche and now it's coming uh, to a theater near you and um, that, that being a racetrack. So it was a paddock experience, um, an outdoor socially distanced um, hospitality, which would normally be in the tent up on the hill um, with Porsche. We, we did it outdoors this time. And then um, just tapping into a local environment in, in Brazelton, a small sleepy town in, in above Atlanta on I-85. And um, I saw that brewery uh, just over a year ago, um, pretty fresh and it just had an aesthetic and, and an amazing architecture that I, I just thought to myself, I was there for a meeting at a, a restaurant across the way. And I, I looked out over um, the, the, the small street and I thought to myself, that that place is going to have a part in our in our recipe, uh, or I, I'm probably overusing that word. Um, just that's going to have a part in our future, um, and yeah, we're just making it up as we go. Um, I think the the next goal, uh, other than getting this book, um, you know, into the hands of the users uh, for the holidays, is um, maybe a small uh, rally or on track experience behind the wheel um, in December. Um, so uh, watch that space. But um, other than that, uh, waiting for the dust to settle and, and would love to try and get back to Durham. Um, Cam, your, your organization was an amazing help in that. And um, what, a, what a, a city and a community um, that, that we want to um, bring our show to. And whether that will happen in 2021 is still to be determined. I'm going to watch how everything develops and um, there, there, there may be a time for that um, a little later on, but um, 
the, the truth is that, that 2021 is still a, a, a blank canvas. And, and as much as that scares me, um, we were at this point in 2009, 2018, we were still at a blank canvas for, for Love 6, uh, admittedly, uh, with Universal. And um, that show went off OK. So uh, we'll be all right. Well, I, you know, I just I can't thank you enough. Uh, you're you're an inspiration. Thank you for sharing your time. You're a remarkable human being yourself, Pat, and you're an inspiration for the Porsche world. So thank you for your time today, and good luck this weekend. We'll all be rooting for you. It's just awesome. Yeah, Thanks. Man. It's uh, it's fun to to connect with you guys. Um, I I know you guys have worked hard on this show, and uh, I I, I want to dig now in and and see some of the other the other episodes. Um, you sort of found me in my um, unplugged state of of just unplugging and, and recharging between races. Um, and it was awesome to be in this environment and not worry about the polish or the trophies or the helmets and, and just uh, just bring you guys onto the, the ranch and um, talk, talk shop. So thanks for making this an hour of me rambling on and giving you long, long answers. And uh, Ray and, and Cam, you guys are uh, figureheads in this, in this um, story that we're all uh, reading. And so thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you, Patrick. We really appreciate that. I mean, I, I mirror everything that, that Cam says uh, about your career and your personality and just who you are as a person, what you've done for our community. We greatly appreciate it. I mean, not, not just on behalf of Porsche Classic, but uh, from personally uh, and from Road Scholars. And, and I just really appreciate that. We appreciate you driving down these deep tracks with us today and talking Porsche. It's been an insightful conversation as always. And uh, the neat thing about this is that these aren't one-shot deals. You know, we're not trying to cover everything with one conversation. So uh, we'll look forward to having you back and talking about other topics here in the future. So until then, be safe out on the track, as my friend Ramsey Potts always likes to say, safety fast to you, Patrick. Cheers. 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 Thanks, guys. Well, Ray Schaefer, we just wrapped up an incredible hour with Patrick Long. What was your uh, takeaways from our time. You know, I'm so I'm so thankful that uh, from a theme standpoint that we have decided not to try and cover everything in one hour because as we've learned early on there with Porsche people there's just so much to talk about and with a guy like Patrick as accomplished as he is at such a young age as he is um, there's so much more to talk about and more to come so uh, I'm thrilled that we had the opportunity to really focus in like we did today talking about the uh, sort of how the a guy who's known as a um, uh, professional liquid cooled 911 racer for his entire career, you know, that whole uh, arc, if you will, from 996 to 992 coming soon, um, and how he became known as to the guy who gave us sort of the air cooled celebration that we so much enjoy. So covering that today for me, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for making that happen. That was fun. I mean, it was so neat to see his uh, really come to life, his determination, his uh, mental toughness, his work ethic and the way that he has kind of evolved, as you said, as the liquid GT racer guy. I mean, he's much more talented than that, but yeah. it's amazing what he's done over three decades, truly a marvel. Yeah, and I think uh, I think looking back on it too, I love I love seeing the, um, the similarities. We know a lot of these folks as either racers or collectors or classic car people, but um, to have a conversation like we did where we're just sharing a cup of coffee and hearing you know, again, his mindset as an entrepreneur, um, not just as a racer, but as a, as a business person with a small business like Luft, getting that going and comparing to, you know, your own experience, what you know every day at Road Scholars, you know, it's different from what I see um, at a company like Porsche. And so it's just, I, I really enjoy that part of it too. So I think, um, I think as folks watch these, start to get the vibe that, you know, we're not just here to cover everything in one hour of a person's uh, career. There's so much to dig into. And that's why we call it Deep Tracks. Absolutely. Well, with that, Ray, why don't you wrap us up? Well, we want to thank, of course, everyone who spent the time with us uh, for tuning into Fresh Brood and Air Cooled Deep Tracks with Porsche Factory team driver Patrick Long. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share our video and soon podcast. And of course, keep driving, enjoying, and sharing your classic Porsche passion. And as we always say, don't just go out and meet your heroes, get to know them. So from everybody from Porsche Classic, Cam, I say so long for now. From everyone at Word Scholars, thank you everyone for tuning in. Make it a great day. See you next time.